Business Value Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Mastery Partners, where our mission is to equip business owners to maximize business value so they can transition their business on their terms. Our mission was born from the lessons we've learned from over 100 business transactions, which fuels our desire to share our experiences and wisdom so you can succeed. Now, here's your host, CEO of Mastery Partners, Tom Bronson. Hi, this is Tom Bronson, and welcome to Maximize Business Value, a podcast for business owners who are passionate about building long-term, sustainable value in your business. This episode is part of our series on books written by Certified Exit Planning Advisors, or SEPAs, as we call them. Uh, I obtained my SEPA certification in 2019. Earlier this year, I was invited to participate along with some other SEPA authors in the author showcase at the Exit Planning Conference in Scottsdale, um, uh, Scottsdale, uh, Phoenix area, where I picked up a few great books. We're going to talk about one of those today, and many of those books, of course, we're going to highlight on this series. In this episode, I'd like to welcome our guest, John. F. Dini, uh, president of MPN, a business transition and exit planning resource for business owners and their advisors in South Texas. He's also the founder of The Exit Map and, of course, author of Your Exit Map, Navigating the Boomer Bust. I met John through the Exit Planning Institute, and I've admired his work for some time. So this will be a fun podcast. Welcome to Maximize Business Value, John. Oh, thanks for having me, Tom. It's really great to be here. So tell us a little bit about your background and why you became a certified exit planning advisor. Well, I'm a, a business coach by profession. I've owned several companies. Uh, I had a distribution company, I had a manufacturing company, uh, I ran a string of healthcare clinics, and then I became a business broker. And as a business broker, I was getting calls on a regular basis from business owners, and you'd go to see them and they'd say, I'm ready to sell my business. And you'd look at it, and I'm sure you've seen this, and they were like really not ready to sell their business. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I started fooling around with some tools, uh, which way down the road grew into the exit map, but it just the tools to help owners assess their businesses and understand how ready they were. And um, I, I kind of stumbled into exit planning. I was brokering. Uh, I was selling companies and selling mostly Main Street businesses and uh, found out that there were a couple of organizations in the country that specialized in this and began following them. I got my SEPA in 18. I got my first certification in exit planning back in 11. And uh, and that's you know, the C, um, e C E X P. Yeah, yeah C E X P. Got it. And um, eventually gave up the brokerage and just started full time helping helping owners prepare for their transition. It's just brokerage is an adversarial game. Um, you've you typically got uh, an owner that's never sold a business and a buyer who's never bought a business and both their attorneys. <laughs> you know. And it's really not my personality profile to be dealing in adversarial situations. Exit planning is so much better. About two thirds of my work is helping owners sell to employees or family. Wow. So, um, yeah, there's all kinds of exits. I, I want to unpack that a little bit. Um, uh, as a broker, it's interesting that um, that you would recognize, of course, when a business is not ready to sell. And I think that that's one of the things that sort of plagues the industry. There are too many brokers out there that will take businesses and offer them up for sale when they're nowhere near ready for sale, which I think contributes to uh, the, the stat that, that makes my blood boil. And that is 17%, only 17% of, uh, of attempted transactions actually reach the finish line. Uh, and, uh, and so I applaud you for recognizing uh, even in your old brokerage days uh, that businesses sometimes are not ready 
uh, to for sale and uh, focused your uh, effort and attention on that. Of course, that's what we do here at uh, Mastery Partners as well. And as uh, some of the folks that are that will be on this particular uh, series, uh, you can certainly consider um, us competitive. But there are so many businesses out there oh, sure. that need help from uh, exit strategists and exit coaches like you and me. Uh, and so, uh, so I'm, th- I mean, uh, what, what's your reaction to that? Do you, do you, my, I, I think that there are sometimes too many business brokers that'll take deals that they know are not going to sell. Right. It's, it's, it's interesting that you say that because it was fascinating to me being involved in the industry and going to their conferences and getting those certifications. Um, there are two distinct schools of thought in the brokerage business. And they split pretty much 50-50 down the middle. Uh, Half of the brokers realize it's an inventory-driven business. The quality of your inventory is directly related to how much money you're going to make from closing transactions. And they are very careful to take companies that are appealing and have their numbers in order and processes and everything. Um, The other half of the industry is very vocal about you take anything that walks in the door and throw it against the wall some of it will stick yeah. and 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 they both have uh, both sides have big followings in the industry uh the problem is the ones that recognize that businesses aren't ready because it's a contingent fee business have no motivation to help them get ready they typically say no i'm sorry i don't want to list you and they wind up with the guy that sticks it all on the wall well, and many times go through one or two failed attempts, right? Until they realize there's some work I need to do on my business to get it ready to sell. Uh, it's, it's the, and the issue with that, with the throw it against the wall crowd, is they typically don't argue the price. So the owner puts an unrealistic price on it. Well, the first thing that happens is they burn through all their qualified buyers. Because the buyers look at it and go, it's not worth that much, and they walk away. And that school of thought is, well, eventually the owner will come around to reality and realize that he's far overpriced. And eventually, after going through the pain of having lots of people walk away, he'll bring it down to a level we can sell it at. But that's, I I can't do business that way. No, no, no. no. In fact, that's, and we do some sell side representation, of course, as a as a broker. We're not an investment. We're not a registered investment banker, uh, but uh, but we won't accept clients in our brokerage uh, house that have not gone through our process to make sure that the business is ready for sale. If sure. they're just looking to slap a price, uh, you know, uh, put a for sale sign in the front yard and and set their own price, and and that's that's for somebody else. That you don't find that kind of work in our place. And so, um, so I, I just I feel like that that is one of the things that has been just a giant disservice in the industry. And I was not aware that there were those two distinct. Uh, schools of thought. See, this is how I learn things talking to somebody who is the at the at the yeah. feet of the master, so to speak. I, I I I cringe at the guys that like to get up there and tell the stories of the same business that they've sold five times in three years. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh man. Yes. Sad, isn't it? Sad. It is. Uh, it is. Sad but true. So uh, so let's talk about your book. Uh, this is your third book about business ownership. You published 11 things you absolutely need to know about selling your business in 2010 and hunting, uh, it, hunting uh, in a farmer's world, celebrating the mind of an entrepreneur in 2013. Now, both are worth exploring on a future podcast. We might be uh, looking for opportunities to do that. But your exit map came out in 2017. What made you write this book? Uh, Actually, I have a a friend and mentor who is a very, very active angel investor. Uh, I respect him a lot. He probably has an all in high tech stuff. He's, He's probably got personal stakes in 60 or 70 companies. And, uh, you know, I would have lunch with him or a cup of coffee and talk to him about uh, the tools that we were putting out that the advisors subscribe to to help 
owners walk through the process of, of understanding what they need to do to be ready. And uh, I said, what would you suggest that I do? And he looked at me, you know, kind of sarcastically and said, well, you write books. Why don't you have a book about this? And I said, that's probably a pretty good point. <laughs> so, so that's really what drove it. Um, you know, the first one, uh, the 11 things about you absolutely need to know about selling your business is a small book and it was really just a step by step this is what you do when you list a business with a business broker uh, and i was still a broker back then okay. uh, the second one hunting in a farmer's world was really my labor of love i mean i did eight full rewrites on that book um it's it's about how entrepreneurs think and why they're different from everyone else um, and it, it touches, in, it, it, you know, further on in the book, it touches a little bit on exiting, but that's not what it's about. So when I set out to write your exit map, I didn't want it to be a how-to, like my first book. And I didn't want it to be an in-depth analytical look at all the ways you can get out of a company. There, there are other books out there that do that and do it very well and are very detailed and quite frankly are very dry. And I can't imagine 95% of the ADD entrepreneurs I wrote about in hunting to be reading these books. Uh, and so I said, I want to write something that they will read. I want to write something that they will enjoy, that they'll pick up and they'll go from page to page and say, this is fun. Oh, I see myself in this book. I see what now I understand, you know, um, but in order to do that, it had to be, like I said, fun to read. Mm -hmm. It is a fun read. Um, I, I enjoy uh, reading it myself. Now, how many, how many you did, what did you say? Eight rewrites on the second book? Yeah. Did you have, did you have to do any rewrites on this book? I, I, I Three. Three. Um, you know, the, the, the old saying in, in, you know, the author world, as you know, is there's no good writing. There's only good rewriting. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, so, I have found that uh, in my book, uh, Maximize Business Value, uh, that uh, do not be cheap when you hire your editor. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, she made my book better. And I actually, my editor, a great, great um, editor here in Dallas, retired late last year, but my second book is coming out uh, later this summer. And, um, and I, I coaxed her out of retirement just to edit my book, uh, which is awesome. <laughs> the funny, the funny thing is, uh, I hired an editor, I fired him. Uh oh, I thought he was abysmal. <laughs> and the person who wound up editing my second and my third book, it was my lead programmer that writes my software. No uh, kidding. And she and she is just terrific. Um, and, you know, we think a lot alike and she understands what I'm trying to do. Uh, so and she'll be doing my fourth book, too. That's awesome. That's all. You know, I noticed it's a fun book to read. Uh, it's a page turner, really. It's, by the way, it's heavy. It's, it is, <laughs> I mean, how many pages? This is uh, 220 pages. But, I mean, you use some really uh, uh, thick stock, right, of paper on this because it is just a heavy – it's a, it's yeah. a hardback, uh, and it's a heavy book. But I it's noticed actually, – It's actually because of all the pictures in it, uh, the illustrations. I, I was going to say – yeah. I counted like what three hundred over three hundred yeah, yeah, illustrations in this. Yeah, well, and we went, and that's why we went with that uh, textbook kind of paper, that yep. that glossy paper that would reproduce really well. Um, with digital printing now, there's no reason not to have color illustrations in a in a oh, book. Yeah. You know, it yep. doesn't cost that much more when you print it. You don't have to charge that much more for it. And again, we wanted it to be fun. We didn't want it to be a comic book. But I was lucky enough to work with a with a woman whom I've known for years, and she's very artistic. And, uh, you know, she's credited in there. And it was almost co-authorship because she has a, a knack for finding a picture that when you first look at it, in, in accompanied with my words, you – doesn't seem to quite fit exactly and then you go oh 
I get it. Oh, and yeah. you smile, you know. Um, and so there's a, there's a little bit of humor there in the picture selection. I thought she did a fabulous job. It's awesome. The uh, how did so it, it was basically her coming up with these. Did you reject any of her? Uh, oh sure, sure. It was it was a it was a, a mutual uh, creative process. You know, yeah. I don't I don't think that shows what I was going for. Right, right. But I, I'm gonna just hold it up here. You can see. I mean, color pictures and and there is. I I I have yet to find a page that doesn't have illustration on it and so mm -hmm. uh or or some sort of a chart or or something like that i like that it kind of makes it a little bit uh, more fun to read although it does add about five pounds to my back <laughs> um you know i went for um uh shorter as well right i mean this is a it's a 200 pages 220 pages and and an easy quick read that's what i was going for in my book as well was a mm -hmm. was a quick read because I know, having been an entrepreneur myself for the last uh, 40 years, entrepreneurs, uh, if I give them some giant thick book, they're never going to read it, right? right. And so, uh, so give them something easy to read that they can digest in a, in a plane ride. And yours is eminently uh, readable, you know, on a plane ride, you know, maybe a plane ride to and from uh, one of the coasts uh, reading your book. It's, uh, it is uh, very easy to do. Well, thank you. Uh, and I, I enjoy it. So the uh, the third book, you know, of course, uh, or it, I'm sorry, the first third of the book, I noticed you kind of uh, divided it into sections. The first third of the book is all about baby boomers and not about exit planning, right? I mean, you named your book, your exit map, and the first third of your book is about baby boomers. Right. Why did you spend so much time talking about their past? Uh Couple of reasons. Um, certainly, the biggest and 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 most pressing reason was the whatever you want to call it, the tidal wave, the tsunami, the the exiting of over half the business owners in the United States over the next ten to fifteen years is better understood with some background. You know, the baby boomers, and we talk about it in the book. The baby boomers. Uh, crushed everything in their way. You know, when we were br when we were growing up, uh, I don't know where you grew up, Tom, but um, you know, I went to school with double sessions because they couldn't build schools fast enough for the baby boom. Uh, oh, wow. You know, I talked to a woman that that lit, was brought up in Brooklyn. They went to triple sessions. Her elementary school was from seven to eleven thirty from noon until four and then from 4 30 till seven at night that's the only way they could fit all the kids in the classrooms uh and the same thing happened you know and the statistics are in the book too because i love i love you know backing it up with the numbers in the in the late 60s to the late 70s we built 600 new community colleges in the united states wow you know, because it's just that, you know, all the boomer kids were raised to want to go to college, right? We're all going to go to college, you know. And then we all got out of college and we found out that corporate America wasn't ready to have five times the executive jobs that they had before. Right. You know, they, they weren't real interested in giving every one of us a corner office. So we became entrepreneurs in record numbers. And bo baby boomers are twice as likely as the generation before or the generation after to own a business. Really? And, and so, you know, if you understand when we talk about the baby, baby boom or the baby boomer bust, uh, it's, it's a real thing. You can't change demographics. I can't change the birth rates of 55 years ago. The, the people are there, the businesses are there, and they're going to exit. We're not going to be able to run them until we're 100 years old, although they, we like to think we can. Right. So, you know, that, of course, it's entertaining. The second reason is people love reading about themselves, and there's nostalgia there. You know, they look at the old, the old television shows, the pictures of families sitting around watching Milton Berle or somebody like that with those little tin TV trays in front of them. You know, um, you know a lot of us that, that are our age uh, look at that and they go, oh, yeah, I remember doing stuff like that. But the real reason is 
I believe you need a grounding in what's going on if you're going to take seriously the fact that planning is going to help you a lot in a market where a lot of people aren't doing it. Uh, I love that. The uh, uh, couple of things that, uh, that I want before we take a quick break here, a couple of things I want to point out. I'm, I'm actually a little bit jealous because the original title for my book was the case for exit planning. So your book gives a lot of great stories and background and, and a lot about our generation, you know, the baby boomers, as I tell my children, uh, Hey, we're the guys that invented this 60 hour work week. You're welcome. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we like to work, right? We do like to work. Uh, and, uh, but, um, but and part of, part of that is competition. Yeah. Oh, yes. Again, there was so many of us trying to get the same job or the same opportunity that the only thing we had was the ability to outwork the next guy. Yep. Yep. That's exactly right. And so, and that's still a very high percentage of the 6 million, uh, what I call small businesses, kind of the lower middle market, 100 million and below. Uh, there's mm -hmm. about 6 million uh, businesses that, that employ people. Uh, and, uh, and still the highest percentage of those is owned by baby boomers. Uh, yes. and, and the youngest baby boomer, by the way, is 58 years old now. Right. Right. And so, Absolutely. so, uh, so, uh, I'm the guy who came through, I was the last baby boomer through the door and we closed and locked it as soon as I got through. <laughs> um, the, uh, I'm a little no, jealous. Look, when you came through, we said, Oh, no more of that. Yeah, please. please. <laughs> yeah. Stop it. <laughs> yeah. The ones that were, you know, that's, Funny, you think about this. My generation, our generation, spans twenty years. Yeah, it's it's crazy, right? I mean, the people that are born in my my parents were in my generation. How do you like that? Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, so, uh, but the the reason I'm jealous is because the original uh, name for my book was called it was called the case for exit planning because I wanted to lay out for business owners the reasons why they should be thinking about uh, uh, planning their exit that, you know, not having some circumstance thrust an exit strategy upon them. I, it's, it's important for business owners to think about it and, and plan it uh, so that they have control of it uh, going forward. But so I wrote the book and I gave it out to a bunch of my clients and still it's just, just a soft copy. Right. And said, Hey, would you mind reading this and give me any thoughts or in, input? And the the two most common things I heard were number one, I hear your voice. I hear your voice in the book, which I think is a is a wonderful compliment, right? I hear your voice uh, in your in reading your book. But the second was, if you decide to call it, you know, the case for exit planning don't bring it within 50 miles of my office or you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> and I, what is this, uh, what is this allergy of, of especially baby boomer business owners to the word exit? You know, they, it's like a, it's like a dirty little four letter word. Uh, what's your perspective on that? It is. It is. As a matter of fact, I just, I have a piece that I wrote that that's coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, and maybe I'll send it over for your blog. Uh, it's dealing with the E word. Um, and, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, on a practical level, it's like committing to a work a five day a week workout regimen. You know, everybody knows they should do it, but we can start tomorrow. Right. 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 <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, um, I love that analogy, by the way. <laughs> Uh, so it's easy to put off. And the other thing is, and this is, this is one of the things, and this is what my latest book is about, is the fear of the unknown. Who am I if I'm not a business owner? You know, uh, you're, you're Bob at Bob's Widgets. You know, you're Bob at Bob's Widgets when you go to the Chamber of Commerce. You're Bob, the head of Bob's Widgets, El Jefe, when you walk in the door every morning. You're Bob of Bob's Widgets at church. You know, you walk through a wedding and your relatives are there and they go, there goes Bob. He owns his own business, you know. Um, and, you know, that's who you are everywhere, all day, every day, 24-7, 365. Who are you if you're not Bob of Bob's Widgets anymore? You've been that person for the last 20, 30, 40 years. You know, and until you can frame 
a new persona, a new idea of who you are and what your purpose is in life, it's terrifying to think that I'm just not going to be me anymore. I I love that. Uh, so what did you say? Frame a new per persona. Um, we do, we do fear that, you know, the other thing that I think that, that business owners, um, fear is, well, I don't, I don't really know what questions to ask. I don't even know how, how do I prepare my business? Who, what should I be doing? And what, and that's, that's why you and I exist, right. Sure. In our, in sure. our professional relationships, uh, with our clients. But it, I, I tell those folks, look, when you started your business, did you know everything that you, that you needed to know or did right. you have to dig in and learn, right? And so uh, same thing when it comes to this. This is, uh, uh, it's so important that, uh, that business owners really understand the need to plan this stuff in advance or they wind up being a stat and, and you just go earlier in this podcast to hear, you know, what happens to business owners that don't plan. Well, we have, we have uh, you know, when people ask me, about exit planning, I say, look, yeah, people ask me all the time, what do I do to make my business worth more money? And my answer is the same thing you should have been doing every day since you started your business. You know, <laughs> hire good people, train them, but put in good procedures, you know, all that stuff. And your exit plan is just the strategic plan you should be doing anyway, but it has a date on it. Yeah. And a time when you need to be finished. Yeah. That's yeah, I love that. Um, it's uh, it's almost like uh, Warren Buffett talking about the power of compounding, right? Mm -hmm. You can't business owners that call me and say, "Hey, what can I do in the next you know uh, six months to double the value of my business?" Yeah, you should have done. You should have been doing that, you know, twenty years ago when right. you started your business. And it's the power of that compounding effect. Uh, that keeps going. Well, we're up against a little break. We're having a wonderful and fun conversation with John F. Dini. Let's take a quick break. We'll be back in 30 seconds. Every business will eventually transition, some internally to employees and managers, and some externally to third-party buyers. Mastery Partners equips business owners to maximize business value so they can transition their businesses on their terms using our four-step process. We start with a snapshot of where your business is today. Then we help you understand where you want to be and design a custom strategy to get you there. Next, we help you execute that strategy with the assistance of our amazing resource network. And ultimately, you'll be able to transition your business on your terms. What are you waiting for? More time? More revenue? If you want to maximize your business value, it takes time. Now is that time. Get started today by checking us out at www.masterypartners.com or email us at info at masterypartners.com to learn more. We're back with John F. Dini, a certified exit planning advisor and author of Your Exit Map, Navigating the Boomer Bust. So, John, would you recommend your book as a guide for an owner who is planning his or her own transition? Uh, that's a tough question. The answer is yes and hell no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's leave it at that. No. <laughs> uh, certainly, I think, uh, you know, the, the last third of the book, the middle third, we talk a lot about the exit process. The last third of the book is where we talk about some of the nuts and bolts. You can do this, you can do that, you can do this other thing. Uh, certainly for an overview, uh, yes. Uh, to become familiar with the terminology and the vocabulary, yes. Uh, do I make any claim whatsoever that it will equip a business owner to design and execute his own transaction? That's the hell no part of it. Uh, right, right. Uh, it's, it's, it's complicated. You know that. It's complicated. We were just talking offline, you know, about clients that we're working with now where, you know, we're, we're picking up things in the conversation that, the owner would have never picked up. They're not familiar with the terminology. They wouldn't understand what was being said. Uh, you know, when somebody, for instance, comes in and says, well, we're going to do a Q of E audit. And, they, you know, an owner shrugs his shoulders and says, great. You know, what's that? And they say quality of earnings. Oh, my earnings are good. My financials are clean. You, that's not even close to knowing what's going to happen to you. <laughs> right, right. 
Yeah, I had a I had a client one time that said, "Oh, they're not going to do any due diligence. They've already said that they're just going to do this little Q of E thing, whatever that." Is. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's that it's, little Q of E thing. Sure. It's no funny problem. when you pay Ernst and Young or RSM uh, forty thousand dollars to come in and do their Q of E audit. You expect a return on that? Yes. Isn't exactly. that odd? Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so it's not meant to be, it's not meant for a business owner to, to be able to map it out and do it all. It's not a do it yourself or type no. uh, book is, uh, is what I'm hearing from you. You know, it, there's a lot of what I really enjoy in the book are tales from the trenches. So why did you use these stories and, and put them in the book? Well, I love stories. All my books have stories uh, and always will. You know, stories are the oldest way for people to assimilate information. You know, the, 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 original, the original news was storytellers going from town to town, you know, telling people, town criers, you know, people telling people what was going on. Uh, so, you know, they're an effective communication tool and they're real. I mean, it took a lot of extra effort. I, a lot of people have stories in their books that say this guy did this and a guy like that did this other thing. You know, I really wanted to go out and get the pictures of the people I knew and get their permission. Those stories were all vetted by them. Uh, they had final say on it. And even the one or two that are not that complimentary to the way the process came out, uh, because I wanted business, business owners are very concrete. They're like, well, is this real? Yes, it's real. You know, these guys exist. You can look them up on LinkedIn and this is what they've done. So I thought it carried a lot more uh, gravitas uh, to have real live business owners that have been through the process speaking through my book. I, I love that. And we do the same thing here on this podcast. Sure. You know, we've had uh, now two series of, Tales from the 17% Club, which are, are these uh, entrepreneurs who have successfully exited their business, talk about it. And I've done um, um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I On each series, which are typically six or seven uh, episodes uh, long, and I have different owners on each one, I always try to include somebody who had just a real dumpster fire, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the first series, uh, I had uh, Jim Roddy who uh, tried to sell his publishing business and ultimately wound up closing the doors. And it was because he was just not, not ready. You know, I, in the last one, I had someone interview me about one of, about my uh, biggest failure uh, in business. And that was the restaurant that I owned. And, and the, the, uh, even though I was able to exit it, uh, it was not a happy story and not a happy ending. And so, uh, and so I think it's important for, for business owners to realize that um, it's a lot of hard work, right? And to hear yes. stories from real entrepreneurs who have been through this, I like that. And I'm so glad that you decided to include that stuff in your book. And, and you just made a real important point, Tom. I know two business owners who uh, in the last couple of years had very, very successful businesses, really attractive offers on the table in both cases from publicly traded companies. And the publicly traded companies did what they do. They threw, you know, seven advisory firms and 16 employees at them, and they were trying to handle it themselves. And in both cases, before they got done with the process, they cratered a quarter because they weren't running the bit running the business properly and both deals went up in smoke and they didn't believe that that could happen to them. But you know, the buyers were only too quick to go, oh, so it's really dependent on you and you weren't paying attention and it went down, thanks, but no thanks, and they walked away. And these were both very high eight-figure deals. Wow. Yeah, in my uh, in my last business, we uh, we sold it ourselves. We had had investment bankers uh, look at the business before, but we decided to do it ourselves because I have done this so many times. But it's because I had the bandwidth. I had you know other other people were running the business, mm -hmm. uh, and so I didn't have to spend. I was not you know running the business and calling the shots day to day, so I had the time to spend on it. But I hired analysts to come into the business to handle the, the rigors of due diligence. 
uh, you know, uh, the the amount of information requests that flow into your inbox uh, from a prospective buyer, if you don't have the bandwidth to do that, you really need to hire somebody uh, that can do that for you, either an external resource like an investment banker uh, or a broker in some cases, uh, or um, hire somebody internally uh, to handle that that so that you don't take your eye off the ball. You still got to run your business. Yeah. And as I tell folks, you have to, even when you're in the sale process, and probably even more importantly, while you're in a sale process, you've got to run it like you're going to own it for the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And uh, it's uh, so frequently, uh, you know, they come to me and they say, well, what can I do? And, and the answer is nothing. Get out of the way. Go run the business. You know, don't your job is to keep these numbers at or better than where they are now. I'll take care of the rest. And uh, it's it's difficult for them because it is distracting and it is different and it is fun and they like being part of the process. And we of course, we keep them involved. Of course, we keep them informed. We don't just say run along and, and you know, go run. Your yeah, business. run along, little boy, go, go run your business. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I had a company I was I was uh, commuting to New York City for two years. I had a company on a 44th Street and I had an ops guy and we had investment banking money in the business and I was leaving him in charge and I said now they're going to come by and they're going to show their investment banking friends this business that they own in New York and they're going to invite you out to lunch and it's going to be fun and you're going to be talking uh, about deals and money and it's really exciting and everything and if you take your eye off the ball and run in this operation they're going to fire your ass and they i'm sorry fire we're on fire your butt. <laughs> that's <laughs> and, all right and, i think and most he, of our listeners have heard that word before. yeah <laughs> and and he didn't listen i went back to texas he was running the operation Five months later, they came in, they fired him, and they said, you're not paying enough attention to the business. He said, well, that's because you guys are dragging me out all the time to meet these guys and do this stuff. And they're like, we don't care. You're gone. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, in the average uh, tenure, I think, of a, of a CEO that sells his business uh, and, and continues on with that business, the average tenure is 17 months, I heard recently. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because you're no longer calling the shots. You got to be really comfortable with somebody else calling the shots. And I, when I've, I've sold uh, two uh, uh, good sized businesses, one to a publicly traded, actually both of them to publicly traded companies. I was going to say one to private equity. We flipped it into a, uh, another publicly traded company. Well, the first time I did that and I sold my business and I went to work for that publicly traded company, I learned something really, two really important things about myself. Uh, number one, I was a pretty darn good CEO, right? I could, <laughs> I'm good at calling the shots and surrounding myself with the right people and all that. And number two, I'm a terrible employee. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> if, if you look if you look at my bio on the back fly leaf of the book it says people refer to john as a serial entrepreneur but he prefers the term chronically unemployable <laughs> yes yes actually a, a great friend of mine here at an uh, entrepreneur in uh in dallas uh, dave cops his wife calls him genetically unemployable <laughs> But, you know, the other thing is, you know, owner centricity is a big issue. Yes. And when we do the initial assessment, uh, I'm a coach and coaches speak the truth. That's that's my job in life. And when I sit down with an owner and the assessment says, uh, I make all the decisions and I work 60 hours a week, I say, your company is unsaleable. No, yeah. Nobody wants to pay you millions of dollars for the privilege of working 60 hours a week. That's not what they're looking for. And we need to fix that uh, before we start talking about how ready you are to exit. Because what, they, what entrepreneurs don't realize is the management team, whether you're going to sell it to the management team, whether some, a third party is going to come in and buy it, how deep your management team is is probably the single biggest factor in the value of your business. Yeah. Oh, yes. I had a, uh, along that line, I, I recently had a client that uh, disclosed to me uh, as we were starting to work together that his plan was he wants to go sell his business soon so that he can take his top 
four managers and go start a new business. And I said, you've just made yourself unsellable. Right. Right. You, know, you, you need a deep management team that can run the business because buyers want to buy a, a, a an ongoing concern. They want to buy somebody that uh, is going to still be operational uh, the next day. Uh, we've touched on two things that I think are uh, one in the first half and one in the second half that I think are critical to uh, to a business owner and probably two of the top five reasons why businesses don't transact. One is that owner dependency, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and having the business dependent on the owner. You need a business that is totally independent of the owner. The owner should be able to go on vacation for a month and not call the office uh, and the office didn't even know he was gone, right? Kind right. of thing. I do have a great uh, friend who's a restaurateur in Chicago. He owns six or eight restaurants. And whenever, sometimes I'll call him, I say, hey, how's it going? He goes, yeah, I'm good. I'm just down here in, in uh, Cabo or I'm off, you know, snorkeling this week, you know, in the in the Bahamas. And I'm like, well, he said, he said but my employees don't know I'm gone. You know, they did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just didn't show up at one of the restaurants this week, right? And so, uh, so I love that. You know, he just he just can go on and be away and and operate. The other is the unrealistic expectations of enterprise value. You know, business owners right. that don't really take the time to understand how businesses in their uh, industry are traded and how they're valued and and what's going on. We get this. Uh, idea in our mind based on God knows what. I, I go into a bunch of different things in my book uh, about uh, valuations uh, and, and why they're uh, mostly wrong. Uh, and uh, so those two are, those are two of the five big reasons why businesses don't transact. What's your take on that? Yeah, my, my, my standard joke about it is, uh, you know, how much is your business worth? $5 million. How do you know it's worth $5 million? Well, I talked to a guy at a trade show that knew a guy in another state that had a business a lot like mine, and he sold his for four times something. I think it was four times revenue. And, yeah. And, yeah. And my business is a li little bigger, and I hear he got four million dollars, so I must be worth five. Uh, you know, and you know, there's no no reality to it. They would never accept a number like that in their operations. Yeah. You know, but but and the other thing is sellers lie. They, and they don't even lie intentionally. Yeah. How much did you get for your business? I got $5 million for my business. Now, he's not telling you that he had three quarters of a million dollars in a credit line that had to be paid off, that they bought out, part of that was to buy out his equipment leases, you know, uh, that uh, uh Five hundred thousand dollars of that is for a two-year work contract that he's still going to have to work out. That another five hundred thousand of it's dependent on an earnout if he can grow the business by twenty-five percent in the next year. But he got five million dollars. Right, right, right. Yeah. At the end of the day, maybe he got two and a half. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah, it's just that the business owners, there's folks out there like John and I who can help you understand what your business is worth. Um, and so uh, please uh, don't guess. Uh, it's real easy to find out, you know, how businesses in your industry are trading. In fact, we've got a spot on our website that gives a free valuation uh, or at least a, uh, an idea, kind of a ballpark of where it should be. I hear that you're writing a fourth book. What is that all about? That's about coaching. That is a book for advisors. Uh, we're kind of passionate. You've heard it. I've heard it. Two different surveys, EPI in 2013, Value Builder this year, have found that 75% of business owners are anywhere from regretful to profoundly unhappy a year after they sell their businesses. Mm -hmm. And that's embarrassing for us as advisors. And I believe it's because people, and we talked about it a little bit earlier in the first segment, people don't dig enough into what's next. Uh, what's your purpose going to be? Who are you going to be when you aren't the business owner? And it's easy to understand. You're being paid to give advice. And, you know, we've all had it as consultants. You go in and you're, you're 
querying somebody about their business and they're telling you more and more. And you come back for the second meeting and you start asking them more questions about the business. And they go, hey, I'm paying you a lot of money. I'm not doing it just so I can tell you about my business. You go, okay, enough questions. I'll give you advice. You know, <laughs> and you're paying me for advice. I better start throwing out some advice here. That's right. <laughs> um, and, you know, you, you've, got to, you've got to set expectations that it's going to take you a while to give good advice because you don't know what options the clients looked at already. You don't know what his ultimate goals are, you know, and you know, yes, you're going to walk in and he goes, I, I want to sell to a third party for $5 million within the next two years. Okay. That, that's great. But too many folks I think are running out and saying, okay, here's the plan. We're going to go for $5 million in the next two years this is what you're going to have to do. And that may not be what he wants. He may want to be able to travel, work at a charity, spend time with his grandkids. He may want to make sure his employees are taken care of. He may want, he may be in a small town where his name's been over the door for a hundred years and he wants it to stay there. There's a lot of other factors than $5 million in two years, you know, and, and I, I feel too many advisors don't dig into that. They get the client's first impression. When I was a broker, People will call you up all the time. I want to buy a light manufacturing company. Why do you want to buy a light manufacturing company? Well, I don't want a restaurant, and I don't think I want to do retail, and I don't have any professional licenses, and I don't know how to build things, so construction's out. So by process of elimination, a light manufacturing company is all I can buy. Well, that's not true. You and I know that people buy other kinds of companies all day long and it's fine. But, you know, they've gone through this thought process and come out with something. And too often that thought process is the thing they tell the advisor and the advisor says, OK, let's make that happen. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, the, you're right. All, all day long. You don't necessarily, if you've got good business skills, right? They're they're fungible. It's like uh, mm -hmm. it's like what I tell salespeople. I started my career in sales, right? A great salesperson can sell anything, right? Um, and uh, you don't have to have specific knowledge about that. That's that's an interesting take on that. We're gonna have to uh, get on the couple of these last questions, but uh, before we do. I want, tell our audience a little bit about your practice and how you help clients drive toward their ideal exit. Um, I, as I said, about two thirds of my work is with internal transfers, uh, especially employee buyouts. Uh, you know, in my first my first assessment with the with the client, I will always ask them, "Are there employees that could run this company without you?" And a lot of times, the answer is. It, yeah, I've got some great guys. I could go away, as you said. I could go away for two weeks. I could go away for a month, and, and the company would run fine. So why don't you sell to them? And they say, oh, well, they have no money. Well, that, that can be fixed. If you've got a couple of years, you can fix the no money situation. You can get the employees in a position where they can get financing to take out the owner. And, excuse me, and, um, you know, they... If you do an internal transfer, you're, you're not adversary. You're not arguing price. You're, you're, you're controlling your timing. You know, it, it puts everything in your control to move forward. So we do a lot of that. I do third-party sales. Uh, I don't broker them. I don't list them on the sites and market them. But I, would, I do a lot of transaction support for people that come to me and say, hey, somebody came up and said they want to buy my company. What, what do I do now? Um, but... Uh, yeah, well, I've got that, and then I've got the exit map. The exit map are the tools, the coaching tools that we've created that we sell on a subscription basis to advisors around the country who have bought into our concept of you need to get deeper with the client before you go putting them on the market. And you do, and I think that that is a great message that business owners should hear as well. You've got to find the find the right advisors and then and then give them the opportunity to go deep uh, because that's the only way to get your business ready uh, for sale. And it's the only way to get yourself ready for that transition that's coming. Well, one last business question, John, and that is this podcast is all about maximizing business value. What's the one most important thing you recommend business owners do to build value in their businesses? Work less. Work less. I like it. Very simple. Work <laughs> yes. 
uh, and that's a winner, 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 chicken dinner. That's probably <laughs> the shortest answer I've had on that. And it's a mouthful and it's uh, a lot to unpack, but we're running out of time. So I have to ask you our bonus question. Our listeners listen all the way to this point to find out how you're going to answer. What personality <laughs> trait has gotten you into the most trouble through the years, John? Oh, impulsiveness. <laughs> Very much so. Oh, you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My my employees, like I, I come into my employees and I say, you know, we're going to change such and stuff. And they, you know, they moan, they groan. But you know what? I'll finish if we've got a minute for a quote by Larry Linney, uh, who wrote Make the Noise Go Away. And he, I, I had Larry down to talk to, to people. I had about 300 people in the room. And uh, Larry said, and we had we had business owners and their second in commands. And he said, you second in commands, how many of you complain that the owner doesn't do things according to the procedure, that he doesn't do what, the way that they're supposed to be done, that he's always doing something off base that you have to go and clean up? You know, they all raise their hands. And then he said, owners, keep it up. <laughs> Your job is to change things. Your job is to look for a better way. Your second in command's job is to make sure everything's done according to the book. Your job is to rewrite the book. Same story I used to hear when high performing salespeople would come and turn in a, a big order and then the ops guy brings it and slaps it on my desk and starts bitching up so one side and down the other about what's wrong with this. I say, look, we don't pay him to get it right. We pay him to bring us the dollars. I pay you to get all to shave all the hair off of this deal, right? <laughs> so right. If it wasn't for that, you wouldn't have a job. So uh, so let's keep going here. How can our viewers and listeners get in touch? with you oh um actually we're in the middle of converting the website uh johnfdini.com uh is still out there but uh if you go to it soon it will be uh it, it will forward to the exit planning dot coach the exit planning dot coach i like that i like that so john thank you for being our guest today I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Tom. It was a lot of fun. Really enjoyed it. Look forward to you asking me back. <laughs> oh, I absolutely will. We want to talk about those other books and then the next one that's coming out. So you can find John F. Dini at uh, the the exit. What did you say? The exit map the exit planning coach? dot coach or yeah. John F. Dini. Yes. Com. Yeah, those are the places you can find him. Of course, you can find him on LinkedIn. Use John F. Dini, D-I-N-I. -I. And uh, of course, you can always reach out to me and I'll be happy to make a warm introduction to John. We're going to be adding links to his books onto our website uh, this week. You'll see them uh, on Wednesday when we do the blog post and of course, on uh, Friday in our newsletter. So be on the lookout for that. Give you a great opportunity to be able to, to buy his books. This is the Maximize Business Value podcast, where we give practical advice to business owners on how to build long-term sustainable value in your business. Be sure to tune in each week and follow us wherever you found this podcast. We would appreciate that. So until next time, I'm Tom Bronson, reminding you to learn as much as you can about exit planning by reading great books written by SEPAs while you maximize business value. Thank you for tuning in to the Maximize Business Value podcast with Tom Bronson. This podcast is brought to you by Mastery Partners, where our mission is to equip business owners to maximize business value so they can transition on their terms. Learn more on how to build long-term sustainable business value and get free value-building tools by visiting our website, www.masterypartners.com. That's master with a Y, masterypartners.com. Check it out. That was perfect. I wouldn't make any changes on that.